has come. Thank you. Maybe may be seated. All right. Let's take our Bibles tonight. Let's go to the book of Ephesians, chapter number four, if we could. Ephesians, chapter number four. I've got a lengthy opening illustration, so bear with me here. But Dr. John R. Rice was an evangelist, now with the Lord, who was asked to conduct a revival meeting at a Baptist church in Woodbine, Texas, years ago. Divisions and strife had broken the heart of the pastor until he had resigned and left. The county missionary, hoping to see the church revived and God's work made prosperous, asked Dr. Rice to come and preach the revival services. He found the whole community divided. One or more deacons had had fistfights in the quarrel that had reached nearly every home. Many had taken a vow never to return to the little church. Dr. Rice never did find out most of the details of the division, but with a burden in his soul, he preached against sin, urged God's people to clean up their lives, and pleaded with them to make peace with their neighbors. Night after night, he preached. Those who had been angry at others were now angry at him. One morning, a woman in the community started to make a telephone call to Dr. Rice just, just to tell him what she thought of all his meddling in their affairs. But her 19-year-old son stopped her and said, Mother, you're wrong. I have just been out in the woods to pray. I know Dr. Rice is right. If we Christians do not get right with each other, we can never have revival. I, for one, am going to try to get right. Well, his mother decided not to make the phone call. In the next service, Dr. Rice called for a time of testimony. With tears streaming down her face, one woman rose to beg forgiveness of another woman with whom she had quarreled. The other woman swiftly rose and came to meet her. They put their arms around one another and wept in the aisle. Confessions came from all parts of the building. The deep moving of God was upon the people as they began to make restitution, ask forgiveness, and seek Christian fellowship again. That afternoon, news went, went like wildfire. That night, the little church building was crowded. People came to church who had not been there in months. Some who had vowed they would never enter the building again came. From the very beginning of the service, the Holy Spirit was there. Dr. Rice preached the gospel, and at the invitation, men and women accepted Christ as their Savior with tears streaming down their faces. Dozens of people were saved, hundreds of Christians were revived, and people came from miles to fill that little church for the rest of the meeting that lasted four weeks in length. Tonight, as we continue our series, Spirit-Filled Living, I'd like to help us address a very common hindrance to God's working through our lives and that's simply an unforgiving heart an unforgiving heart Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 we'll pick it up here tonight let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Tonight we're going to look at this passage, and we're going to talk about not grieving the Spirit. Not grieving the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful tonight for the truth that we'll look at. And Lord, it's such a significant part, but not always an easy thing for us to do, is to forgive, especially when we... Uh, have been hurt, but Lord, we, we look at this tonight looking for you for help in understanding the great moral obligation we have to forgive and that we can't be filled with the Spirit unless we do. Father, thank you for the truth we'll look at. May you give help tonight to anybody here that's in this struggle, even right now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. At the day of salvation, the day we get saved, God does us a tremendous favor, doesn't he? Amen. He forgives us of absolutely everything we've ever done. <laughs> you believe that? You believe that God forgave you and forgave me as some of the things that we did? Maybe nobody knows about them, but we know about them. And he did so very, very willingly. He, he didn't begrudgingly say, all right, I forgive you. You know, sometimes when, when somebody asks forgiveness of us, we're like, oh, okay, fine, you know. But God doesn't do that at all. He's very merciful, and he's more willing to forgive than we are oftentimes wanting to be forgiven, which is ironic. Psalm 103, verse 12 says, as far as the east is from the west, 
So far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Of course, the East and West, they never meet, right? right? And there's a great distance that God places between our sin and himself when he forgives. Micah 7.19 says, He will turn again, turn again, he will have compassion upon us, he will subdue our iniquities, and now will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Now, there are parts of the sea that are quite deep. Tens of thousands of feet deep. And, and, and that's the imagery that God wants us to get when it comes to how he forgives our sins. As he casts them into the furthest part of the sea so that, that they're never mentioned again. When God forgives, he promises never to hold our past sins against us anymore. He'll never bring them up again. And really, that's the essence of forgiveness. Letting somebody off the hook and never bringing it up again. Never holding it against them again. When God forgives us, God chooses to live with the consequences of our sin against himself. Do you realize that tonight? He has chosen to, and willingly so, to not to, to live with the consequences of our sins against him. Forgiveness really is a tremendous act of mercy. When God could have easily have taken his wrath out on us the moment we sinned against him. He could have. And with that sin forgiven, it results in something real special within the heart. Peace. Peace. Romans 5.1 says this, therefore being justified by faith, we have what? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace. In other words, there's no more guilt, there's no more shame, there's no more hiding before God, there's no more, we can be open and transparent and at rest with God Almighty. The word justify means we have been pardoned before God. And that produces peace between us and him. And going forward, as we walk in the Spirit, as we've been talking about in this series, we experience that peace as a part of the fruit of the Spirit, right? Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, etc., etc. There, there's, these are the three innermost things that we feel or sense within, this, within our soul when we walk in the Spirit. And the peace is there because our fellowship with God is unhindered now. It's, the sin problem has been removed. If you go to the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter number 1, John here writes and, and, and expounds thoughts on having fellowship with God. Of course, that's made possible because of the death of Jesus Christ and the salvation that he brings and the spirit that now indwells us. But there's some things that's, that are mentioned here in 1 John verses 5 through 7 I want to talk about here a little bit. It says, this then is the message which we have heard. Or actually, let's back, back up to verse 4. And these things write we unto you that your joy might be full. Okay, The Christian life is meant to be joyful it's meant to have peace. It's meant to, you're, you're meant to, to sense love. All these different things, right? And John's writing this epistle, amongst many th reasons, is so that God's people would have some joy in their life. That, that they would have a reason to live and to get up in the morning and to walk through their days happy. Not sour-faced. Not disgruntled. But joyful, you know? Like, happy. And that's what he's writing here. That your joy might be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So he establishes this point. God is light. That means he's holy, he's pure, he right, he's righteous. That's what it refers to. And in him is no darkness or sin at all. Okay, we understand that. Now verse 6, it says that we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, in sin, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ. His son cleanses us from all sin. So we see here, when we walk in the light, when we walk in a right with him, 
we have fellowship with God. And his presence in us becomes very real in the life of a born-again Christian. However, we have probably all experienced a lack of peace within our hearts that results in verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. In other words, people say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm walking with God, but yet they have no love, joy, peace permeating in their heart. There's a, there's a problem there, isn't there? They're walking in darkness. Maybe today you, you, you say, well, that might describe me a little bit. In fact, within me lies a lot of turmoil in my soul. Can Christian people be in turmoil? Absolutely, they can be in turmoil of soul. Maybe tonight you say, I continually feel anxious about something. I feel continually angry or upset about something. I feel kind of down a lot, Pastor. Though I know I'm saved, I remember the time and the place when it happened. I can, I can take you to that place. I, I remember when it all happened. I was I'm in business with God. I understood the tenets of salvation. But right now, all I feel is anxious, angry, or depressed in life. And I, I don't have a whole lot of joy and peace. I sure don't feel very loved. And if I were honest, my fellowship with God is struggling. In other words, God feels quite distant from me. God doesn't feel very close. I feel like there's a, a bit of a wall, if you will. And I try to get close to him, but it just doesn't seem like I get very far. Can you relate to that at all tonight? Really what I want to address is that I want to help. Because if we can't have fellowship with God our Christian life will fall apart. It will fall apart. You will not finish faithful. I guarantee you, you won't finish faithful. You will fall. I will fall if I don't stay close to him. But if there is something that's hindering my fellowship with, uh, with God, then I need to address it. I need to address it. And tonight, I want to address one of the most common problems for Christian people that robs them of that fellowship that, that would bring them the peace and the joy and the love that they desire. And that is this. Unforgiveness. Bitterness. This is, the, this is what is one of the biggest hindrances to that, to experiencing those things up there on the screen. It will rob you of all those things every last time. Harboring unforgiveness and bitterness against somebody or somebody's. Now in our text back in the book of Ephesians, we see here very plainly that the spirit can be grieved and that God says don't do that. <laughs> And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Don't grieve God. Don't grieve Him. But Christians that are, are hurting themselves. It's hurting them. When we live grieving the Spirit of God, it will hurt you personally. It already is. It already is. And as long as we want to maintain that posture, we can't live filled with the Spirit. We can't live filled with the Spirit. The Christian life, the way God lays it out in His Word, becomes impossible to live joyfully and willingly. It's impossible. The commands of God are impossible without God's help in us overcoming the flesh and overcoming the things and to do it joyfully. I want to live my Christian life joyfully. Yeah. I want to do things because, you know what, I, I, I love God and I know that he loves me. But harboring bitterness will rob you of all of that and it will weaken your ability to live for the Lord. Now you might be able to put a front up in church, but I'll tell you something, living, everything behind the scenes will be different. And what, by the way, what's going on behind, in the behind the scenes eventually comes out front. Mm -hmm. It does. It goes on the backstage of life, always comes out in the front stage. 
eventually. But we want to be able to be as real when nobody's looking and when people are looking. The same person. And that takes a filling of the Spirit of God. That only, but if, if something's hindering that, we need to address it. And this is an er issue that really creates problems for God's people. More than we want to admit. So let's consider our text and, and this thought today as we see first off what I call the residing spirit. Now verse 30 it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Here it communicates to us that we are sealed by the Spirit until that day of redemption, until in essence the day we go to heaven. This re is a reference to the fact that God, the day he saves us, gives us the Holy Spirit as a down payment, or earnest payment as it were, of his promise to take us to heaven one day. 2 Corinthians 1.22, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. It's God's promise that you will go to heaven, that you will not lose your salvation. I'm glad God does, you can't lose your salvation. There are groups that teach you can lose your salvation, but they are fundamentally wrong. Because you could do nothing to earn your salvation, you can do nothing to keep your salvation. That's impossible. Now you can sin against God, and if you're truly his own, he will give you spiritual spankings. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> if you are not his own, and you claim to be his own, and you have no chastisement, then you are not his own. And there are people today that walk around with false professions of faith, or, or, or never understood the tenets of salvation, and, and I've, known, I've, known, I've known these people, I've, I've met some of these people that didn't understand anything when they were led through some prayer or anything like that, and, and it didn't help them at all. Eventually, sometimes they get saved, and it's like, yeah, I, I didn't have a clue. I didn't have a clue. I didn't understand these things. Somebody ran me through a prayer, just dunked me in a tank, and that was it. And it's like, okay, no, we want to be careful when dealing with a person's soul. We don't want to just be flipping about that. But I'm saying here is this. The Spirit of God, the day he saves you, seals you until the day of redemption. And that spirit, of course, as we've seen, resides within us, dwelling within our own being. We are, as the Bible puts it, the temple of the Holy Ghost. And we know these verses, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. There's a lot wrapped up in that. But I, I want to make a point here. At salvation, consider this, the Spirit checked into your body. Just like we check into a hotel. I'm sure most of us here have stayed in a hotel at some point, and you have a time where you check into that hotel, right? Now, one thing that the Holy Spirit likes is that where he abides, it's clean. You ever been to a hotel... A lot of you are laughing about this. You're like, look at the picture, look at the place. Look at the picture, look at the place, right? Isn't quite what you were expecting, right? You know, maybe it's a little dirty. It smelled. Maybe it had rodents. A broken bed, a broken appliance. Again, this description didn't line up with reality. And it doesn't lend to a positive experience. When somebody walks into a hotel room, they want it nice. Even if they tend to be messy as people. Nobody wants to walk into that, right? The bed's all made, messed up. The, you know, there's, there's goop on the, on the counter, on the table. You know, the, the, there's rips in the, in the upholstery of the chair, whatever. You don't walk in there. You walk in there, you know what you do? You'd walk right out and go down there. Give me another room, Right? At least most people would. There's always the exception to the rule. I understand that. But well, let's just say most people. You know, we were on deputation, and we were in a lot of different places, and a lot of different churches, and we stayed in some nice places. But we do have our stories, too. <laughs> every missionary, every church planner who's ever on deputation, they always have their story. And I could tell you, I could tell you a few of them. I, I won't tonight, but, but I'm just saying... I'm just saying this, nobody likes staying in a dirty room, right? Nobody likes staying in a dirty room. Can I say the Spirit doesn't either? 
The Spirit doesn't either. He doesn't, he doesn't want a dirty place to hang out. And when it is dirty, he gets grieved. He gets grieved when the residence, our bodies, is unclean. See, the Spirit likes dwelling in a holy life. And the Bible admonishes us about holy living. Look at Ephesians 4, verse 24, just a little few verses back. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Okay? Now, there are tons of verses on this subject matter. Uh, there, there's lots of them. There, there's nowhere in the Bible that says it's okay to be worldly. It's no, nowhere in the Bible does it say it's okay to be unholy. And nowhere in the Bible does it say that, that uh, we should not strive for that. And quite contrary, we should be striving for holiness. God knows we'll never be perfect, holy like him until we've got a glorified body. That doesn't mean we shouldn't strive for it. Because the cleaner the vessel, the more the vessel can be used. There's, a ton of, there, there's lots of verses on that. You can't argue that. But a holy life begins first and foremost with a pure, clean heart. If you go to Matthew 23, we'll have to hustle here a little bit. Matthew chapter 23, Jesus is addressing the Pharisees who outwardly looked very holy, but inwardly they were not so much. And I want to emphasize the fact that holiness begins first off with a clean heart. Jesus says here in Matthew 23, verse 25, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you make the clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, the heart, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto white and sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. They had, a, they had a knack of looking good outwardly, but inwardly they were filthy. So if my heart's right, then the outward doesn't matter. No, that's not what it's saying either, folks. Notice again, Verse um, 26, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. It starts within and it works its way out. It's not without hiding junk within. Okay? That's the way it's supposed to work. A holy life begins when everything is right between us and God in our hearts. And it works its way outwardly in the way one acts, the way one talks, what they do, what they listen to, how they dress, all of that and more. Everything. When the heart is right, the commands of God are not grievous because the spirit will be happy. If I can put it that way, he'll be happy because his place is clean. His place is clean. And like a house, it takes daily diligence to keep it clean, doesn't it? Sure doesn't take much for it to get dirty, does it? It doesn't. A few plates here, a few dishes there, a few unwiped up messes there. Before long, it's, it becomes, if you continue to not pick up things, it's just going to compound, right? We, we understand the second law of thermodynamics, right? Everything left to itself tends to go into greater disarray and disorientation. That means that's symbolic of the fact that we, it takes daily diligence on our part to stay clean. 
1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We need a daily washing, as it were, cleansing of our own soul. And we do that through, of course, confession. Can I ask us here tonight, how clean is the Spirit's temple in your life and mine? How clean is it? Well, I haven't done anything wrong. Well, have you thought anything wrong? <laughs> Let me tell you, we have, to, we have to do our best to keep it clean. Because the Spirit does not like to abide in a dirty abode any more than we do. Which leads to, secondly, the grieved spirit. Now, go back to Ephesians chapter 4. We see this grieved spirit in Ephesians chapter 4, and verse number 30. It says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Again, obviously, the spirit can be grieved in the life of a born again Christian. Now, Webster defines the word grieve as to give pain of mind, to afflict, to make sorrowful, to offend, to displease, to provoke. When we speak of being grieved, it means we, in essence, we, we have some sort of hurt within our heart. We're bothered. We might say our soul is vexed, as grieving. And that's exactly what the Spirit will experience. He's no longer all that happy. <laughs> Again, if you can understand what I mean. That's why God's people experience times, even seasons, even lengthy seasons, of no sense of God's love for them, no joy, no peace within them, even if they get what they want in life. Even they get everything they want in life and everything they've been hankering after, they just can't find resolution within the soul. They just can't find, I, I don't know why, I got everything I want, but I can't resolve the inner issues within. That's because nothing outwardly can fix the problems within the heart. Because if you're truly saved, the Spirit is grieved within you or within me. And it creates all those negative feelings I mentioned earlier. The anxiousness, the anger, the depression. Nothing can fully relieve those things until the Spirit is no longer grieved. One of the most significant ways in which the Spirit is grieved is harboring bitterness. An unwillingness to forgive another over an offense or offenses. Most counseling seems to have to start here as it is probably the number one issue creating every other issue. Most counseling books I've studied, I, I've come across, it's just like, this is always the number one issue. Uh, right behind is if somebody's been involved in occultic activity. But this, this issue of forgiveness. If you go to Matthew chapter 18, there's a parable Jesus gives that expounds the consequences of one unwilling to forgive as he or she, as it may be, has been forgiven. Matthew 18, and I'm going to read it fairly quickly here. It's, it's not long, but for the sake of time, it says, Because Peter came to Jesus and asked, How many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times, and he thought he was being generous. Verse 22 of Matthew 18, Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants, and when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, a fraction of what he had owed. 
and laid his hands on him and took him by the throat. You know, that's, that's a death grip, by the way. That's a death grip. Saying, pay me what thou owest. And the servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when the fellow servants saw that what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. And then his Lord, after he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I have pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. What's he saying here? When we don't forgive, there's an unleash of a tormentors in the life of a person. In other words, the devil is allowed access to your life and mine when we do not forgive somebody. And they, they will torment you with thoughts and feelings that are negative. And it will continue and continue until we pay all that is due unto him. Living in a state of bitterness will torment the soul. It torments the soul. In other words, you can be laying down and all you can think about is that person. You're just grinding in your, in your mind the negative thoughts. And all you can think about is what you'd like to do to them and what you'd like to say to them and how you'd like to get your pound of flesh, as it were. All these negative things start reeling in your mind. And, and I'm sure you've experienced this, as I have experienced this. It doesn't produce love, joy, and peace. It creates a lot of torment and a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of moodiness, a lot of issues. You, you, you ever meet somebody who's moody? I'll guarantee you they probably have a bitterness problem. Oh, every time. They have a bitterness issue. There's a root of bitterness within them. And you can't hide that. You cannot hide that. It just naturally comes out. Because these tormentors are released in life. It gets to the point that when people will try just about anything to rid themselves of those tormenting feelings, but nothing works except God's remedy for it. Forgiveness. Hebrews 12, verse 15 says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. In other words, they failed to receive grace. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Many people's lives will be impacted by that. See, it never stops with one when somebody's bitter. Right. Lots of people like to spread the wealth. <laughs> you know what I mean by that? Oh, they like to spread the wealth. Spread the joy of their spirit, you know. I'm, I'm bitter. I want the whole world to know about it. You say, why do they do that? Because I believe they think they'll feel better, but they don't and they won't. And in the day of age of social media, you have people spewing out their bitterness for the whole wide world to hear. And it's pathetic. It really is. And they're hoping because if they get more people to, to understand and, and sympathize with their bitterness, they'll feel better, but they don't. Never do. All they're doing is defiling others. And uh, that never helps. I'll never forget this post somebody that my wife knew years back. She posted on, I think it was on Father's Day. It start, I think it started off to the dude that fathered me. I give you no credit at all for raising me and, and went on and gave a lot of outlandish statements. And it was just like, yeah, I wonder if she's bitter. I wonder if she's bitter. Now, evidently, the father did some things he shouldn't have done. I, but at the same time, too, the response was not helping her or anybody that was, she was telling 
through her post. It just doesn't do anything, does it? Many are defiled. Jesus wasn't shy in the fact that we will face offenses in this sin-cursed world. Luke 17, 1, then said he unto the disciples, it is impossible, but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. But you shouldn't be offended by Christian people. You don't think after being 25 years saved and in, in the ministry almost 15 years, I haven't had some people level some nasty things at me? Oh, I'm sure you have. If you've been saved any length of time, I'm sure you have too. Can I say this? It hasn't knocked me out of church. No. Hasn't caused me to stop serving God. Hasn't caused me to compromise my convictions. Because you know what? I have to make a decision at some point. Am I going to let that offender knock me out of the Christian race or I'm going to forgive and, keep, and let God deal with the offense? That's the decision you'll have to you will cross many times in your Christian walk between now and death. And God's given us the remedy here to overcome this so that bitterness does not take you down. Because there have been people who have been faithful for years who got bitter and got knocked out and are no longer faithful like they had been. We have to resolve this God's way. Harboring bitterness, refusing to forgive someone who will, will grieve the spirit within you and rob you and I of every ounce of any sense of God's love for us, any joy or any peace we hope to have. But there is hope. But we have to apply God's remedy as we see, thirdly, the forgiving spirit. Let's go back to Ephesians 4. Thank you for your patience tonight with me. Ephesians chapter number 4. The end of the passage tells us so plainly. He says, And let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one unto another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Say, so what stops the spirit from being grieved? Number one, repentance of the forgiveness or the bitterness of the heart. In other words, God, I am sorry for being a bitter person. And putting it away, putting it away. In other words, choosing to do something different than, than what's being said here. And actually the opposite of it. And that's what verse 32 talks about, being tenderhearted and forgiving. The struggle, though, is our sense of justice because we feel that our offender should not be let off the hook so easily. Because that's in essence what forgiveness is. You're letting that person off your hook, but they are not off God's hook. Paul wrote in Romans 12, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. But I want to repay. You, you and I can't repay. Because we can't justly pay something back. And God, by the way, when he uses his vengeance, is meant to bring that person to repentance. All we want to do is destroy. So all we want to do is destroy. We want to tear down. We want that pound of flesh. We want, we want them to feel pain. Yeah, that's no better than the offender. That's no better than the offender. But we, there is that struggle. And some things are tough. There have been some offenses that are very difficult to overcome. I understand that. But the truth is, as long as we stay in that unforgiveness, harboring bitterness, our offenders are still hurting us. And they will hurt you even if they're long dead. <clears throat> Forgiveness actually unshackles us from them. Breaks the chain between you and them. The cross of Christ makes forgiveness a moral obligation on our part. It's the right reaction to a wrong done against us. And God expressed that to us. That despite how many times we have wronged him. He forgives us. That's why in verse 32 it ends, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Again, the whole phrase comes up, you don't understand what that person has done. You don't understand. And I may not. 
I'm not the one saying this, though. This is God's word saying it. And I'll say this, Jesus knows how it feels. He knows how it feels. He was hurt more than any of us ever will be hurt. You want to talk about somebody who went through the most unjust treatment of all time. It was Jesus Christ. But yet as he was being nailed to that cross, after being whipped with the cat of nine tails, after being mocked and unjustly found guilty, what did he say? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Could you imagine that? I don't know how I could do that. He could do that because he was God. And if he can, he can do it, he doesn't tell us to do anything he hasn't done himself. How do I forgive someone so that this inner turmoil I feel leaves and I can have fellowship with God again? I want that restored. And that's the gist of my message here tonight. How can I get it restored? I handed out a sheet to you because there was no way I could get through this in one night. And I wanted you to bring it, have it as a reference guide for you. But I'll just mention a few things very briefly in the synopsis of what is said on those sheets. Number one, ask God to help you bring to mind anyone you have not forgiven and the specific offense and make a list. You know what? You can even have forgotten about it, <laughs> ironically. I was like, oh yeah, that's right. But ask God to bring to your mind God, is there somebody I have not forgiven that I need to? And God will do that to you. Just be patient. Let him bring those things to mind. That specific hurt, as it were. And make a list. Number two, deal with each person and situation by praying something like this. Lord, I choose to forgive the name of the person, whoever it is, so and so, for whatever that specific offense or sin was. You have to be specific about it. And you can say, I release so-and-so from the debt they owe me, and I will no longer hold this offense against them. You have to get specific. Say, that really hurts to think about that. Yeah, you have to, it has to touch the inner emotional core of your being for the healing to begin. See, what we're trying to do is not address the problem. It's like having a sore tooth but not going to the dentist. Once you go and get it pulled, it's not so bad, but we're, oh, I don't want to pull, have it pulled. But you'll feel better in the end. You have to see the long-term thing of it. Forgiveness is an act of the will. I'll forgive when I feel like it. You will never feel like it. I don't feel like it. <laughs> I don't think you are. You know, you will never feel like it. It's an act of will, and as I said, you may not feel like it. But healing in your heart cannot begin until we make that willful choice and address those things specifically. And you stay with that person or situation until it has been dealt with. What if it comes back into my mind again? Do the same thing over again. Lord, no, I have chosen to forget it. Because the devil wants to try to keep you thinking bitter stuff. Does he think you bitter? If he can get you thinking bitter stuff, then he's got you. He will control your life. He will make you miserable. But you know what? My goal tonight is to help you get joy. Help you have peace. Help you to enjoy your Christian life. But you and I can't if we're bitter. He can't. It's just never going to work that way. Stay with that person until all has been dealt with. And maybe there were multiple offenses. Deal with each one. Tell God how it made you feel. Tell God all of that. And address it. For some tonight, it might even be God that you need to forgive. Again, as corny as that sounds, remember what forgiveness is. We're letting God off the hook. Because some people are really bitter at God. Because God hasn't done this, 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 this. And it's ruining their life. 
just absolutely ruining their life. And we have to say, God, I forgive you. I'm letting you off the hook. I don't have the supreme knowledge that you've got. I know that all things work together for good, and I'm sorry for my bad attitude against you. For some, it might be God that you need to forgive. Again, God doesn't do anything wrong. But we got to let God off that hook, thinking that he did something wrong when he didn't. Until we forgive, the spirit will be grieved. The Christian life will lack the inner peace, the inner joy, the sense of love that we all need and desire from God. That's what Christianity is supposed to give us. But if it's not there, then something needs to be addressed. And this is a major issue that often needs to be addressed in God's people's lives. May God help us all have the courage to deal with these issues so as not to grieve the spirit. Let's take a few moments tonight and stand to our feet as the pianist comes to play for a few moments. Maybe tonight there's somebody that you need to deal with right now. Don't delay. Deal with that person. As the pianist softly plays here with heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe there's somebody that you, you need to forgive.